Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our very special lecture this afternoon. I'd like to introduce our DVC Teaching and Learning, Prof. Sin, who will be doing our welcoming for this afternoon. Thank you. Welcome. Wamkele Kile. Welcome. On behalf of the Nelson Mandela University, our Vice Chancellor, all our DVCs, everyone in the institution warmly welcomes you to this afternoon's event. Uh, I think a warm welcome, first of all, to our uh, professor who's going to be delivering today's uh, talk and engaging in discussion with us, Professor Michalinos Zimbalis. Uh, Dr. Mukim Weng will introduce him in a little while. Next to him is Professor Shirley Tate. Uh, those of you who were here at yesterday's talk will know her, and I believe it was a very stimulating event as well, speaking to issues of race and gender. At our DVC, Professor Andrew Leach, who is here, will do the <coughs> thanks at the end. Welcome, Prof. <coughs> to our students and staff, our deans, uh, all of you who are guests at today's talk and engagement, a very warm welcome. I think we've been waiting for a long time to have this uh, discussion again. We've had the discussions around decolonizing education. It was very much on the agenda last year. Um, and I think it has been present in a lot of what we have been doing inside of our faculties, inside of our uh, entities, in the various forums and spaces where people are meeting to say, what is it? that uh, is the most important imperative at this time as we think about transforming higher education and transforming our curricula. Um, what you all probably know is that our name has changed. We are no longer that university. We are now the Nelson Mandela University. And together with that name, of course, goes very weighty responsibility and very weighty accountability. So we ask of all of our people to hold us to account, uh, to hold ourselves to account, to carry a name that is worthy of all of the ideals that Nelson Mandela stood for. From the students will remind us, his time as a struggle activist, a fighter, to the mature human being who tried to show the kind of leadership that would bring us together, continuing to work towards social justice. So with this uh, name, of course, we have a new vision and mission. And it's only slightly changed, but I'm going to read it to you anyway by way of welcome, because I think it also holds us to account. It is a lofty vision and mission, and it goes like this. The vision is to be a dynamic African university recognized for its leadership in generating cutting edge knowledge for a sustainable future. Our mission is to offer, div a div a div sorry, is to offer a diverse range of life-changing educational experiences for a better world. Now, this is extremely challenging to be offering to all of you, to all of us, a life-changing experience. And what does that mean? And how do we then engage with our own lives to make that a reality? So for us, it's about repositioning in many senses. Repositioning who we are <clears throat> what we are, and how we are, in order to achieve that, to be worthy of our name. We've got to look at our transformation imperatives and its alignment with our vision, mission, and values. But most particularly, we have to look at where that lands. And we think that the place that it lands is, in fact, in what happens in classrooms, you know, what happens in the spaces that is our university. It's what happens in curriculum. And so this topic today that uh, Professor Michalinos Zambalis is going to 
introduce us to and engage with you about is probably the most important topic that we are thinking about today. We're going to think about our curriculum renewal in terms of its purposes, in terms of its content, in terms of how it is offered, and the environment in which it takes place. So we are going to be looking at how, through the kinds of discussions we have, we develop the critical tools, as well as the epistemological tools, the proto concepts like decolonization and Africanization and what that means in terms of how we put that into practice. So we hope that this engagement is going to be a really lively one. We hope that you're going to ask really challenging questions. That's what we know you for. Uh, um, a group of uh, engaged scholars uh, that ask difficult questions. So we're just preparing you, Mithalina. So I think you know that that is a par for the course. And we look forward to the kind of engagement that will continue beyond today. Um, we are, in fact, having a whole series of things happening this month, but hopefully throughout our year as well. But this month is a special one. It's the 1st of August, and it marks the beginning of the month in which we celebrate and highlight the importance of diversity, which is one of our values. So there is a, um, a calendar of events which we hope you will look out for uh, practically every day of the week for the next few weeks that make up August that focuses on a particular aspect of diversity. And we hope that you will engage richly with all of these. We also have um, the National Science Week, which is going to be hosted by our institution, will be on our Mission Vale campus. And there have been a whole series of talks and lectures uh, and engagements running up to National Science Week, also focusing on really interesting topics like women in science, on how do we get science to be more um, accessible, how do we engage in science activities across gender, across race, across languages, in ways that are meaningful. So I think we are indeed trying to create the spaces for the kind of engagement that can be life-changing. That doesn't only happen in classrooms. It happens in spaces like these. So a very warm welcome to all of you. I'm glad that there is sitting room only. Um, we were asked why didn't we have this in a bigger venue. And uh, we certainly will continue to have these and hopefully in bigger and bigger venues so that more and more people will come and engage in this way. But more importantly, take what you engage about back to the spaces where you find yourselves. So a very warm welcome to all of you and we know you will enjoy today's engagement. Thank you. Dr. Moore. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Goedemiddag, dames en heren. Mine is to introduce um, our speaker today, Professor Mikalinos Zimbalis. Um, he currently holds the following positions. He's an associate professor of education, and I've, I've done this inten inten intentionally because I know you can read that. So you've read that, that's fine. And he said to me before I introduced him that I don't need to read his whole CV of 62 pages. So I'm not going to read that, but I've extracted some of the, uh, the things that I think are important. And I've intentionally done so, so that when you want to network with him, at least you know what his interests are in. He's also a visiting professor and research fellow um, at the Institute for Reconciliation and Social Justice at the University of Free State here in South Africa. He's a research associate at Nelson Mandela University here in South Africa. He's also director of curriculum development uh, at Cadet Center for the Advancement of Research in Educational Technology, which is in Nicosia in Cyprus. Um, his areas of uh, concentration are cur curriculum theory, philosophy of education, peace, intercultural citizenship education, online teaching, and learning, those who are busy with recurriculation, so we can talk to him. Research interests are, they lie in the area of exploring how discursive, 
political and cultural aspects define the experience of emotion and affect in curriculum and pedagogy. He is also particularly interested in how affective politics intersect with issues of social justice, pedagogies, intercultural and peace education and citizenship education. He has published very widely in peer-reviewed journals and book chapters. I tried to count. I couldn't you know, get the number, so I, I just gave up. <laughs> he has taught at Intercollege in Cyprus, in Michigan State University, and the University of Texas in the United States of America. He started his career, which is particularly something that I'm interested in. He started his career in education as an elementary school teacher, teaching grades one to six. For that, I take my hand off. He's <laughs> also a member of a number of professional scholarly and scholarly body, bodies. He's um, received funding for a number of his, his, his projects. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, join me in welcoming Professor Mikalinos Zimbalis. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted and honored to be here. Thank you for the generous introduction. Um, I also want to thank um, professors uh, Alan and Denise Zin and Professor Andre Kidd for their hospitality these past few days. Uh, I hope I'm not going to get into too much trouble from what I'm going to say today. Um, but I, I do hope to contribute in, in the um, ongoing conversation that, uh, that's been taking place in this country and in other settings about uh, decolonization. So my point of uh, departure is, uh, is this renewed interest in decolonizing higher education, especially after roads must, must fall and fees must fall movements. And globally, there is a lot of um, discussion that comes in different names. For example, we have the notion of decolonial, uh, decolonial term. We have the idea of uh, decolonial thinking. We have also the notion of decolonial gaze. Now, decolonial thinking has existed since the very inception of modern forms of, of colonization. So this is not something new. What we are talking about decolonization uh, uh, nowadays is not something new. However, um, it, it, there has been a shift toward uh, decoloniality that took place in recent decades and it's still uh, unfolding today. Now, there are many questions um, about decolonization. And I've listed some of the usual questions that are being asked in, in various conversations, not only in South Africa, but, but worldwide. For example, well, what does decolonization entail? Why the need to decolonize? What are the challenges of decolonization? What are the limits placed on the decolonization project by the forces of neoliberalism? Is decolonization the same as Africanization? Is decolonization the same as transformation? Because some, sometimes we use those terms interchangeably, and I will argue they are not the same. Um, and we need to make the distinctions conceptually and politically and practically as well. Uh, how does the colonization of curriculum and pedagogy take place? What does decolonization in higher education look like? Are there any tensions, complexities, or paradoxes emerging in decolonization efforts in higher education? I don't think you expect me to answer all of these questions, but I, I do, I, I'm going to try to touch on all of them at least somehow. So here, here how is the structure of my presentation? I will say a few things about the meanings of decolonization. Um, I will provide a short journey through some of the decolonial uh, thinkers' ideas that I'm using just to uh, give you some background of some of the concepts that uh, I think are valuable and I will be using later. Um, I will talk about some limits and risks of decolonial thinking because I think we need to have that discussion as well. Um, 
I will make the conceptual distinctions between uh, decolonization, Africanization, and transformation. And then the main part of my talk will be on the different approaches uh, in decolonizing higher education, especially in relation to curriculum and pedagogy. And I will end with what I consider so far from my discussions with you, with many colleagues uh, around South Africa, uh, five fundamental shifts for decolonization in higher education that need to take place to move the project of decolonization forward. So let's start with the notion of decolonization. Obviously, it has different meanings across different contexts. There are some important ideas. I want to highlight two of these important ideas. However, please keep in mind that the notion of decolonization has to be seen contextually. Uh, what decolonization means and entails in uh, National Mandela University might be different from the University of Free State. There are similarities by any means, yes, but you have to define in this context what decolonization entails because the needs are different from a different context. However, generally speaking, there are two fundamental ideas that I, I want you to keep in mind. The first one is that it resists Eurocentrism and acknowledges the contributions of colonized population across the globe. And the second one, it has a moral imperative, a moral imperative for righting the wrongs of colonial domination and an ethical stance in relation to social justice for those peoples enslaved and disempowered by persistent forms of coloniality. In other words, decolonization, it is the interrogation of how Eurocentric thought, knowledge, and power structures are implicated in the marginalization, exploitation, and exclusion of colonized peoples and groups, and it aims at reimagining modernity. I will talk about this extensively, how uh, uh, colo colonize, colonialism, coloniality is entangled with modernity. So if we want to talk about decolonization, we have to imagine modernity as a project of violent, epistemic, and territorial expansion to clear its past and point towards different future. So we need to do this, this, this task in order to reimagine the future differently. Now, there are many decolonial thinkers. Um, uh, sometimes you will find in the literature, you know, talk about decolonial thinkers and post-colonial thinkers. It depends also on the geographical area that you're talking about. But mostly today, I'm going to talk about a few decolonial thinkers from from Latin America, uh, specifically uh, Quijano, uh, Mignolo, Buenventura de Sousa Santos, and Silvia <coughs> Winter, because they have been influential in the work that I'm doing the past uh, uh, few years. Um, and I've picked very, it's a very selective journey through some of the concepts just to make sure that we are talking about um, uh, that we clarify the concepts that we'll be using later in, in the talk and the discussions. So I'm beginning with uh, Kihan. His notion of coloniality of power, very important concept, uh, defines it as a global hegemonic model of power in place that articulated race, labor, space, and peoples according to the needs of capital and to the benefit of white Europeans. So you see from the very beginning that we're talking about a system that is entangled with capitalism. You will see this. This is a trend that you will see in the thinking of many decolonial thinkers. This entanglement between uh, colonialism, coloniality, and I will make the distinction shortly, and capitalism and modernity. So coloniality is a system 
that defines the organization and dissemination of epistemic, material, and social resources in ways that reproduce modernity's imperial project. And for the mathematicians in this room, we might have a, a very simplified equation of coloniality. It's a combination of speciality, the control of lands, racism, elimination and subjugation of difference, and geopolitics of knowledge production, epistemic violence. So coloniality has these uh, three major um, elements, according to Quijano. And he makes this very useful distinction between colonialism and coloniality. Colonialism is a, is a temporal period of oppression that has come and gone. However, coloniality is the logic, the underlying logic, the system that places peoples and knowledge into a classification system that in such a way that European is valorized. And uh, Quijano argues that this is still very much with us today. So he says it's more, much more accurate to talk about coloniality rather than colonialism, which, is, which he sees it as a, as, a, as a period of oppression that was uh, uh, in the past. Now, Walter Mignolo, another powerful thinker who uses the idea of the colonial matrix of power and knowledge that does not serve all humanity but a small portion of it that benefits from the belief that in terms of epistemology there is only one game in town and that is Western epistemology. So um, he argues that coloniality and modernity go together because modernity provides a, a rhetoric of salvation, and we can see it through uh, Christianity, through Christian discourses, through the civilizing mission uh, of the missionaries, uh, and also contemporary, this, this is uh, some examples, in contemporary discourses of development, especially, you know, uh, different funds uh, from uh, international or other organizations in Africa arguing about development and, and Mignolo and others argue that there is a lot of uh, covert or overt uh, coloniality uh, in the assumptions that you will go into a country with a particular framework of development and um, uh, modernize, supposedly modernize uh, this according to uh, Western models of thinking. So he's the one who's, who's talking about the notion of decolonial thinking, and decolonial thinking aims at engaging in what he calls epistemic disobedience in order to envision social life, knowledge, and institutions Different. He says we have to be disobedient to the hegemonic uh, Western uh, epistemology if we want to uh, further the project of, of decoloniality. Now, Buaventura de Sousa Santos, also another thinker uh, who uses uh, the notion of epistemologies of the South the unique epistemologies that have emerged from the South, highlighting in this matter that the South is not just a geographical, but rather an epistemic and political marker, a source of unique knowledge emerging out of the experience of various forms of oppression. So he wants to highlight the experience of the South as a particular form of experience that comes from oppression, Epistemologies of the South have been consistently delegitimated through the process that he calls epistemicide. He has a whole theory about how, how this is happening. Uh, and namely, it means the, the matter of knowledge, the matter of Southern knowledge, Southern theories. Um, one of the most important ideas, concepts, is his notion of cognitive justice the recognition of epistemic uh, diversity. And, and he frames this argument uh, saying that 
we cannot have a struggle for global social justice unless we also have cognitive justice. So he sees these two as, as very much entangled. The struggle for social justice cannot be separated from the struggle of global cognitive justice. So you cannot talk about social justice while there is cognitive injustice going on. When Southern uh, epistemologists of the South continue to be marginalized and delegitimated, and then have as a separate project the project of social justice. These are very much entangled. And finally, I want to end with Sylvia uh, Winter, uh, who talks about uh, colonization practices are entangled with the long history of Western imperialism and capitalism, and thus are reflected in knowledge production processes and institutions, including the university. So Winter puts forward a notion of humanness, not as an individual autonomous entity, but a collective body and praxis. And she writes, being human is not a noun, it's a verb. Being human is a praxis of humanness. So it's not something essential, it's, it's what happens, what we do. And so knowledge is embodied, and situated as raised. This has implications because it changes the way you think about humanness. Knowledge is embodied and situated as raised and gendered in marginalized and colonized settings. So he, he talks about genre-specific modes of being human. There are different genre-specific modes. One of these genres is the trajectories of the Western <coughs> genres of human that are linked to, to with colonialism as economic, cultural, and historical technologies of power that produced and normalized unequal racialized categories, making distinctions between human, subhuman, have and have nots, rational and irrational. So what is the way out, according to Sylvia Winter? She says we should not abandon humanism because there is also that argument. We need to move some some theorists argue, to post-humanism, with whatever that means, and there are different definitions of post-humanism as well. She says we should not abolish humanism, but rather reinvent it so that the consequences of colonialism are acknowledged and dismantled, and the knowledge production paradigm is reconceptualized. So, to recapitulate on what I've said so far, to summarize you know, uh, some basic ideas that I want you to keep in mind on decolonization. The first one, Eurocentric knowledge has to be deconstructed and reconstructed to acknowledge the contributions of, of colonized populations across the globe. Second, Colonialism, modernity, and capitalism are very much entangled. They go together. You cannot disassociate them. Social, number three, social justice is inseparable from cognitive justice. This is particularly important for the project of uh, decolonizing higher education because we basically deal in universities with formations of cognitive justice. So our work has important impact on the wider project of, of social justice. Number four, coloniality still continues to deny the colonized and historically marginalized spaces to legitimate their own epistemic frames. Its implications need to be critically evaluated. And five, decolonization is not an event. It's a process, and it's not easy to achieve. This demands a lot of reflection, because there is often the misperception that decolonization is an event that is going to happen, then we'll reach you know, something decolonized, and then we move on. It's not like that. And it reminds me, there is a wonderful quote by Habermas in the aftermath of the Holocaust, 
uh, in Second World War, when he says that there is not a single act of liberation that will get us to the detoxification of uh, German society. Detoxification is a process. It's a long, painful, uh, dramatic, occasionally challenging, difficult process that we have to go through. So get ready for the ride, all of us. Now, I think it's proper to acknowledge some risks as well, because there is always the danger of um, romanticizing these concepts or the processes, or investing too much when they don't offer uh, as much. So one of the risks is essentializing this this complex knowledge formations, rendering false dichotomies or moral evaluations between, on the one hand, the good African versus, on the other hand, the bad Western knowledge. And I think we would run into many problems if we replace Western binaries uh, with new binaries. It's like replacing one uh, uh, one regime with another regime that reproduces uh, binaries, but it's just this time there are different kinds of binaries. So I think we should be careful. Um, and we have a lot of good ideas from colleagues, both in South Africa and abroad, how we may avoid this, and I will talk about this uh, soon. And the second one is it is more important, as some of our colleagues argue, to take African experience and theories seriously rather than claiming a uniquely African epistemology. Why? Because there are complex entanglements between knowledge formations. I know this is a contestable idea, but I think I put it out there for our reflection because, again, it runs into the danger of essentialism of essentializing, like we did with Western epistemology, we are doing with African or any other epistemology, and we say, you know, there is this epistemology in this box, there is this epistemology in this box, they are so different that they, they, they have no relationship, no communication. And I think that's a that's, uh, dangerous assumption to make. Now, another sensitive issue is uh, decolonization versus Africanization. Again, there is a lot of debate. I'm not going to do justice to the complexity of the debates that are going on. But I think um, it's important to at least mention Fanon and Nguki on the notion that uh, how decolonization is different from Africanization. We have, on the one hand, Fanon, who calls who, who sees calls for Africanization with skepticism because he says they are haunted by the dark desire to get rid of the foreigner, of the foreigner and sometimes they constitute inverted races. And then on the other hand, we have uh, uh, Ngugi who talks about a different notion of Africanization, uh, who defines Africanization as part of a larger politics of, of language, the mother tongue, how we need to teach the mother, uh, the mother tongue in, in, in Africa. And so decolonization, according to him, is not an end point. Again, here is the idea of decolonization as an ongoing process. It's an ongoing struggle over what we should be teaching ourselves and our children in Africa. And the answer is not the same always. There are different answers, as I said, depending on the context, but also depending on the politics. And I will talk about later, you know, how the vision, the political vision you have, uh, often create different trajectories for, uh, for understandings of Africanization. So the call for Africanization is a project of decentering 
according to Nguyen. European knowledge and recentering knowledge so that you take into consideration, you put into the center you know, African knowledge. And I know that, I mean, and you know better than me, that there, the, this, uh, there is ongoing discussions about this. So it's not settled, but it's just ideas for us to consider they are very much relevant, just as the notion of decolonization versus transformation. Often, I think we confuse these two terms. And I want to borrow the ideas of, of Jonathan Janssen here to, uh, and agree with him that transformation is a much broader and complicated process than decolonization. It includes a lot of other things such as failing public schools, addressing this issue, addressing the failing healthcare system, addressing corruption. So he views the process of social transformation as a much broader, and I think that uh, decolonization to, to radically challenge change society is a task that goes beyond decolonization. Decolonization is a valuable tool that needs to take place and support the broader political vision of, uh, of transformation. It's a necessary, but not sufficient, because there are many other things that need to be done besides decolonization, at least besides the decolonization of higher education pedagogies, which is the topic of today's uh, discussion. Now, let me go more into the uh, more specifically uh, the, 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 the area of higher education. There are different approaches. I, I list here three. I'm sure you can name numerous others. Those are not necessarily um, uh, one does not exclude the other. They are very much relevant, but they are different approaches because they have been uh, documented as different approaches taken by different you know, uh, places or different understandings or theorizations that need to happen in higher education to talk about decolonizing higher education. So one of them, the first one, is transforming, disrupting, the institutional cultures as they now exist, privileging neoliberal structures. There is a lot of uh, discussion about institutional cultures in South Africa as universities. So this is one, one way of doing it. Change the institutional culture. Another way is curriculum and pedagogy. How, uh, how it, we need to dismantle the Eurocentrism that's taking place in curriculum and pedagogy. And the third one, transforming, disrupting these dominance by pointing to knowledge possibilities that have been denied relevance. Indigenous knowledges, uh, local knowledges, uh, uh, African epistemologies, Southern epistemologies, and so on. They are not mutually exclusive. Let me repeat that. They're very much related. So you might choose for strategic purposes to focus on institutional cultures, for example, changing the institutional culture of the university to decolonize the institutional culture. But I think it will be hard to do that without going in depth to address at least issues of curriculum and pedagogy. And this is what I want to emphasize now. Let me take first the notion of decolonizing university structures, and I borrow the ideas of Ashil Bembe here. Uh, decolonizing the university implies a range of transformations that need to take place, from democratizing the systems of access and management to reversing the systems of authoritative control, standardization, classification, commodification, accountancy, and bureaucratization reflected in the organizational structures, teaching methods, and assessment mechanisms of students and faculty alike. All these things, says Bembe, have to change if you want to talk about decolonizing the university. And there are two very powerful quotes I want to share with you. 
The first one is to decolonize implies breaking the cycle that tends to turn students into customers and consumers. So again, remember the notion that we talked about earlier, decolonization, modernity, and capitalism are you know, very much interconnected. And the second one is to decolonize the university is to reform it with the aim of creating a more open, critical, cosmopolitan, pluriversalism, a task that involves the radical refounding of our ways of thinking and a transcendence of our disciplinary divisions. <coughs> the disciplinary divisions, a remnant of Western uh, epistemology. We have to question that as well, Bembe says. Do not take it for granted. Now, about pedagogy. There has been a lot of discussion in the past 10 years specifically about what it means to decolonize pedagogical uh, teaching methods. And I have one of the first quotes that you find in the literature by uh, Tejida, Espinoza, and Gutierrez from 2003, an edited collection on, on pedagogies of difference, that say, who, who argue that decolonizing pedagogy must be guided by a conceptually dynamic worldview and a set of values that make it, and I, uh, I underline these terms, anti-capitalist, anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic. It is informed by theoretical heteroglossia that strategically utilizes civilizations and understandings for various fields and conceptual frameworks to unmask the logics, workings, and effects of colonial domination, oppression, and exploitation in our contemporary context. I think part of the legacy of the disciplinary divisions that I talked about earlier is the legacy of the different fields. For example, in the work that I'm doing, there is human rights education, citizenship education, social justice education, peace education. But deep down, if you look very carefully, you will see that they have a very common ground. If you want to dig deeply, they have similar principles. It's just this notion of you need to focus, the Western notion, that sidetracks and provides a different trajectory, and now you claim, well, I, my field, my area, is like uh, human rights education. Well, they are very much relevant. They have a common vision oftentimes. It's just a matter of emphasis. So we can join forces in fighting and struggling against colonialism, oppression. So if, you, uh, if one is doing work in human rights education, but is, but is unaware of the richness of work in related areas like peace education or uh, anti-racist education, we are missing something because we, we are not aware of how to join forces to push the agenda of, of transformation. So this is why this, this, uh, these authors argue that these different pedagogies are very much interconnected and they can join forces if they want to be more effective. So decolonizing pedagogy draws from various theoretical frameworks, post-colonial studies, critical pedagogy, critical race theory, black feminist theory, so that educators and students are offered spaces and tools to recontextualize knowledge from non-Eurocentric perspectives. Second, it recognizes and takes an active stance against the multiple ways in which knowledge production in the neoliberal order is implicated in the material conditions of coloniality and its persisting effects on understandings of education and higher education. And three, it provides educators and students the analytical and methodological tools for debating, challenging, and deconstructing inherited canons. Here's another quote 
that educators are called upon to play a central role in constructing the conditions for a different kind of encounter. At the end of the day, this is our goal. It's a, de it's a reimagining of encounter with, with others, <laughs> an encounter that both opposes ongoing colonization and that seeks to heal the social, cultural, and spiritual ravages of colonial history. So, more specifically, what does it mean to decolonize the curriculum? It means first to liberate, and this is, again, this is a kind of a very uh, eclectic, if you will, um, summary of some of the ideas from, from the literature. Uh, first, liberate the curriculum thinking from Cartesian boundaries, the arrogant I of Western individualism. For example, include Ubuntu philosophy, interconnections with other human and non-human beings. Second, redesign curricula to include local epistemologies, indigenous and other knowledges. So we remember notions of uh, recentering uh, knowledge from the ideas of Ngugi. Uh, and number three, rethink radically Western disciplines and their contents to include, for example, knowing uh, through the pain, anger, and other experiences of colonial expansion and, de and decolonization. So there is a list by Subedi, three ideas, three more practical ideas, because I, I, sometimes I'm being asked, okay, this is nice, this is theoretical, we get the idea, but practically, how, how can we do this in, in, in redesigning the curriculum or in redesigning pedagogies in the classroom? This is only one example, there are many. The, one, the first one is adapt an anti-essentialist uh, stance. Uh, Anti-essentialist critiques the monolithic portrayal of, of knowledge while emphasizing the value of recognizing not only the link between Western epistemology and modernity, coloniality, but also the contribution made, made, made by the South. The second one is what Subedi calls contrapunal readings. It focuses explicitly on questions of colonization and imperialism. And the, col and the colonizing curriculum historicizes the post-colonial conditions and their entanglements with power structures. The most simple example is, you know, you can have a curriculum, for example, at the University of Free State or National Mandela University that includes only Western philosophers uh, in philosophy 101. It, I mean, you have to include, but, but the problem is not simply to add readings by Ngugi or by others, because that would be what in the 1980s, in intercultural education, we would call an additive approach, simply to satisfy reactions, okay, let's include two, three readings by African you know, philosophers and we feel good, we are fine. No, the, the, the point is how to engage in a, in a critical discussion, how to put these readings together and what do they mean in this particular context. So the third one is ethical solidarity. It is attentive to how questions of solidarity have been conceptualized and it emphasizes the need to mobilize collective struggles across differences. This is, um, I adapted this from a nice diagram by Vanessa Andreotti, uh, an article from 2015 that I think summarizes the different, what I call, what I call types of desire change from everything is awesome, we don't need to change anything, to you know, the most radical uh, reform, beyond reform. 
and I will talk briefly about each one. And, and at the back of your minds, I, I want you to think very specifically and critically about your own circumstances and your own institution. And on the one hand, what do we want to achieve and what is currently the reality? So this, this has to be put into conversation. So on the, uh, on, at the very beginning, we have, you know, the denial. Everything is awesome. No recognition of decolonization as a desirable project. So nothing needs to be done. No, no change. The second one is what uh, uh, Andreotti calls soft reform. No recognition of decolonization as a desirable project, but inclusion of some other. It's the additive approach that I, that I mentioned earlier. So you provide additional resources to indigenous, racialized, low-income students to equip them with the knowledge, skills, to excel according to institutional rewards, but deep institutional standards, but deep down the structures of the system remain unchanged. So this is the soft reform. Now, here is the radical reform. The radical reform is you recognize that there is epistemological dominance, there is damage that needs to be done, and it's, and it's just the first step. It's not the end of the road. It's just the beginning of a very long process of radical reform that uh, abides by different principles. Here, there are Nancy Fraser's classical uh, ideas of recognition, representation, and redistribution. You need to recognize you know, the contribution of others. You need to find ways so that you encourage their representation. So it's not simply, I recognize that you exist, but actually you have you know, political representation in say the most uh, simple and naive example I have to say that I heard it yesterday in the conversation, the voice of students. Students should, should, students' voice should be considered into the conversation. If they are not considered, then you are not into uh, serious reform. And redistribution of resources. And there are various ways that you do uh, uh, redistribution is not simply economic, it's the different structures and opportunities. So empowering marginalized groups and redistributing material resources. And uh, Andreotti includes a fourth category, a more, uh, if you will, a more beyond radical. That's why she calls it beyond reform. It's dismantling of modernities, systematic violences. It's a specific project of engaging into attacking the consequences and the structures of uh, capitalism, colonialism, and racism. And uh, obviously, this demands much more of a lot of things, of commitment, of organization, and, and several other things that we might uh, talk later. So uh, here, are a few provocative questions by Andreotti. Um, and I, I'll, I'll just, I'm not going to read them. I'll give you a few seconds to, to, to read this quote. Okay? And another, another one. Here she picks on academic writing. Uh, and we can adjust this to teaching or uh, curriculum or pedagogy. And she says, what would academic writing look like that acknowledges but goes beyond or does not rely solely on model representation? What other vocabularies, media, and collective spaces might enable us to change our relationship to modern modes of signification? How do we balance this 
with the demand to make ourselves intelligible to the institutions and social relations within which we operate. And in conclusion, now I'm going to summarize um, the five fundamental shifts that I think I've collected so far for the decolonization of, of higher education. And by no means they are the only ones, there are many more. It's just, um, I think it's, I find it often challenging to find a round number, five or 10 or 15. So I could never have seven, for example. I had to find five. So, first one, awareness of colonization is not enough. Its consequences must be exposed and challenged. Second, reject the discourse of deficiency. A dominant thinking in higher education in South Africa attempts to understand student difficulty by framing students and their families as lacking academic and cultural resources. This is a fundamental uh, Eurocentric uh, epistemology. The discourse on deficiency. We see this in many places, not only in South Africa. Uh, Three, acknowledge the socio-political context and its challenges and develop a strategic stepped approach to challenge colonized practices and structures. This is particularly important for each institution. There is not a recipe for all 26 South African universities. We might be talking about the colonization of higher education in South Africa, but it means, as I said from the very beginning, and implies very different things from, from institution to institution. So if you want to do your homework and you want to do it well, then you have to be strategic. You have to take step by step. You cannot dismantle the whole system. Go to the beyond reform category from day one. This is unrealistic. You have to set your goals, and you have to be strategic in picking the battles you need to pick. Some of them you might lose. Some of them you have to insist. Good intentions are not enough. This was the subtitle of my, uh, of my talk today. Good intentions are not enough. We, we hear about good intentions everywhere. You cannot be neutral. Neutrality amounts to perpetuating the status quo. And finally, accept a loss of likability. You will make enemies, but you have to live with this. I leave you with two of the quotes that I like by Fanon and Ngugi, whom I mentioned earlier. I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to uh, put them on screen for you to reflect. And the second one. And this is the end. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Okay. So that's one, that's two. And please speak into the mic when you um, present your question. Do I have a third person? Ooh, ooh, ooh. And there's a third one. Okay, I've acknowledged you. So that's number three. Let's first start with those uh, hands. Nancy? Hi, I'm director of the School of Computer Science, Mass Physics And we find it a real challenge to address, as I say, as you say, we cannot accept the status quo. But how do you decolonize computer science when your students have to work in a South African economy and in a Western economy and still make their education relevant? Thank you. Um, Nancy? Thank you for your um, talk, Tom. Um, it was very enlightening, especially for myself. I'm, I'm struggling with um, decolonizing in my own space and in my own curriculum. Um, and I know that you, you mentioned that I should ask my questions, but I can't remember what it was, but I have another comment <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> But I have a comment just in terms of this process today, because you were also here yesterday, I mean, quite a few people were here, about a third of the room was here yesterday. But in Prof. Tate's talk, because both of you are talking about decolonizing in higher education, Prof. Tate's talk focuses on the black woman academic navigating the space. And your talk focuses on pedagogy and teaching practice. But look how full the room is today. Mm. So it's as if people want to talk about decolonizing when it works with the theory. Mm. People want to listen. There are many managers here today, far more than there were yesterday, far more men here today than there were yesterday. And I want to ask, how are we moving towards a more decolonized space when people are, seem to be primarily interested in the narrative and the theory? Mm and seem to forget that the racism is enacted on the body, the bodied subject as well. And that it comes from the bodied subject. It doesn't float in the air or in the book. So, thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Um, there was a hand over there. Yes. I'll come to you. Your fourth because she... <laughs> Um, it's, a, it's a question, I'm afraid, sorry Nancy, it is, is, it is theoretical, but I thought that potentially one of your additional um, uh, things to think about with decolonization is actually re-articulating a vision of so-called Western technology or something like that, or the so-called Western attitude, because you tend to say, well, we need to avoid binary thinking, we need to avoid Western binary thinking, and the binarism of the West, and you've then oversimplified what a Western tradition is, because an anti-binary thinking, a thinking of complexity has come into Western discourse in 70 years ago, say, with very early construction, all of that kind of thinking. And that reiterates a tradition that goes right back to Heraclitus. Um, so there isn't a monolithic Western uh, simplified discourse that you can set up as a straw man to decolonize. That part of decolonialization is to decolonize that simplified understanding of what a West Offers. It would be something like that. Can I? Let me just sketch him and then we we'll finish with the first part of this. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm sure everyone can hear me. <laughs> it's for the record. It's for the, the video recording. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, Prof, my name, my name is Art. I was listening to your presentation and um, when you speak of decolonization, uh, you were more focused on high institutions. Now, in my understanding, 
universities are a microcosm of a society. There's, a, there's an Italian Marxist called Antonio Castro. He wrote a theory of hegemony. He says one of the things that emerged after colonialism was capitalism. Now, when capitalism emerged, class cooperation was formed. Hence, now, we have an understanding of saying universities are a bourgeois space. Now, my question is, when you're going to come with a reformist agenda within a microcosm of a society, are there any necessary contradiction between those reformist agenda and the revolution? <laughs> Let me start by the last uh, question now that is fresh. It, it, it's a very good uh, point. I love Gramsci, and I'm glad you, you uh, mentioned him. Um, and there is a contradiction um, in the sense that a society who benefits from the structure will not dismantle itself. Now, the question is always, well, how do you dismantle hegemony? And there are different uh, theoretical uh, and political and moral responses to that. So I, I, I don't think we could uh, you know, have uh, offer an, ins uh, an easy answer. But uh, I get your point, and it's a very valid point that when there is valid interest by uh, the structures of the society to reiterate and reproduce those structures, um, if you look at the table that I, that I uh, gave earlier, you might end up with very uh, low expectations in terms of what you can do in this, in this uh, structure of the society. So you're right that the project of decolonization is very much entangled with the, with the overall social transformation, and that's why I put that, that slide. And to be honest, I'm not, I'm not sure um, I, 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 I cannot speak on behalf of the South African society, and I think it would be dangerous to make any generalizations whether the society, whatever that means, wants to reform itself, and how much each university in each province can actually contribute to that. I think that's, that's a debatable issue. Uh, but I think what the university, what each university can do is make its contribution to the project of decolonization and social transformation. And as I said, it's not going to be easy. It's very, um, there are going to be many challenges. There are going to be many people and interest groups uh, against that. Uh, but then the trajectory that will be eventually taken um, cannot be predetermined. And I don't think you can say, if you do A, then you will get B. If you uh, act in this way, then you will uh, be successful in decolonization. And if you act differently, you will not. The only thing that will determine that is experimenting with different ideas and different practices. Not ideas, practices. How you enact different ways of being in the world. And nobody can tell you how to do that. You have to discover it. So I'm sorry I cannot tell you more uh, or give you any, any more information. But um, I think it would be dangerous to um, uh, get into uh, generalizations. But thank you for your question. It's, it's, it's a very good question. Um, now, our colleague over there, that's a very good point, and, I'm, and, and I apologize if I left the impression that, because that would contradict my whole argument, if I would essentialize, you know, Western, there are obviously many manifestations, and if you go back to, you know, ancient Greece, um, then obviously you find uh, very uh, many ideas 
that also in, in that you can find in African epistemologies as well. So there are many so there is not a monolithic way of African epistemology or Western epistemology, but there is a set of of principles that I think we have to agree that they drive many uh, Western uh, ways of thinking, um, and and these are these are the binaries. That, um, that have prevailed in particular uh, philosophies and ways of thinking ha that have been predominant and have had an impact, historically speaking. So uh, there are variations. Uh, it's not a monolithic way of epistemology. There are many epistemologies, and some epistemologies are very much connected with other epistemologies that you would call Southern epistemologies. But again, to essentialize them would be dangerous. So very good point, valid point, and I thank you for that. Um, now, uh, there was a, a good observation here um, that, uh, yes, oh, the, the, uh, how do you, how do you decolonize computer science in a Western uh, economy? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know partly, not only because I'm not in, 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 computer, in computer science, and um, I, I will dare to say a few very general things, but please don't take them as generalized as they might sound, because I, I do think, if I have to stick to my argument, then you have to find a way within your discipline. And, and um, for example, the notion of uh, interdisciplinarity. Uh, that might be one idea to pursue, and I know many universities in South Africa restructure their, their disciplines and their divisions to make them more interdisciplinary and encourage collaboration, that will infuse computer science with different epistemologies that will give it a different uh, perspective. Um, that is not, and, and I'm talking about the idea in general of the discipline because I'm not familiar with computer science, obviously. So um, I think there are, uh, there are a number of things from what I've said here that you can take uh, you know, the anti-essentialist stance, the, uh, uh, the historicization of the discipline, you know, how, you know, the foundations of the disciplines were formed, with what consequences. So this is the most, I guess, I can offer, given my, uh, my ignorance of computer science. And, and this is something you have to uh, uh, explore with your colleagues. Uh, Building on some of the more, if you will, theoretical ideas that I mentioned here about curriculum uh, and pedagogy and enriching the curriculum and enriching your pedagogical uh, practices. I'm sorry I cannot uh, offer more, more than that. <laughs> uh, thank you for your answer. I think the same would apply to some of the disciplines in my school. Okay? Yes, the yes. The question applies to maths, to physics, and stats because these all need to be westernized by nature because they don't apply. That is just my opinion. Show me the messenger. All right. Yeah. Let me just take over my control. Um, excuse me. Let me just take over my control. Can we not have a dialogue because we have a set of questions? I understand your... your, your, your urge to want to respond. There's one more last one uh, from Nancy. Yes, observation. There, there is one. Uh, that's a very good observation. Uh, but I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't necessarily take this as, as an indication of you know, lack of, uh, of, of interest on the part of the community uh, or more interest for the one or the other. Um, there are many, many reasons for that, making the assumption that you know, the audience is different and there, there is fewer people or more people. Um, it depends on many circumstances. If it's something that 
is uh, perennial to the institution and the organization, then, then yeah, we can talk about it. But if it's, you know, um, if it's a matter of some circumstances, uh, so you know better. <laughs> All right, thanks for that round. Um, now we're going to our second round of hands. Um, one, and good, Chris. You've been what is this? Three rows and then a dima. How many do I have now? About one, two, three, four. Go ahead. Then we move. My comment is with regards to the question on how one decolonizes computer sciences. Um, and before I answer, I would like to say I'm answering this question as an undergraduate student who has just written a paper on the decolonization of ICT education and it's been accepted and I shall be presenting it in Portugal. And <laughs> When you ask the question of when you ask the question, you said, "How do you decolonize computer sciences?" When students then need to go back and um, functional work within a South African economy, which then also functions within a global economy. Um, first and foremost, I think what we need to understand with the decolonization project is that the purpose of decolonization, especially of education, is not so that we can create cogs in a capitalist machine. We are moving towards enabling and empowering as well as ownership. With that being said, we then go back and ask the question, what is the purpose of education? And then we decolonize that question and say, what is the purpose of education for a black child in a South African and African context? And that is where we draw our answer from. Now, with the decolonization of education in institutions of higher learning, especially, for example, in ICT and other faculties that you have mentioned, the purpose there would be also to center Africa in curriculum. We are saying let's put Africa at the center of producing knowledge, new knowledge production, as well as engagement and research and teaching and learning. And by so doing, we then take the problems that Africa has into cognizance and say, how do we, through decolonization, rectify and move towards an Africa that is self-sustainable? And with that being said then, in the context of graduates, we do not want graduates that merely have skills to function in the economy. We want graduates that are in tune and are aware. So an ICT graduate, for example, walks out with the technical skills of computer science, but without the knowledge of the socio-economic problems of this country and this continent and how they can use ICT to contribute towards socio-economic transformation, towards social justice, towards cognitive justice. So, in, in, in closing, ultimately, I think we need to understand the purpose of decolonization in order for us to be able to then apply decolonization within our disciplines. Thank you. Sounds like an A paper to me. <laughs> instead of coloniality. And I wasn't quite sure how that conceptual explanation was useful at the beginning if you keep on going back to what you said it was no longer useful then. What, yeah. what is useful is no longer being used. And then in the five fundamentals that you mentioned, I found them quite useful as well. Um, but I thought there's something that is also missing there. But you mentioned it in your presentation, but you didn't actually zoom it down into one of the fundamentals that colonization is not an event, but it is a process. 
Another one that I think is one of the fundamentals is the fact that um, the agenda of colonization, we should actually know exactly who should be on the driver's seat. But I think, I think that should actually come in the, in the five, I mean, in, in the list of the fundamentals. But uh, in the agenda, in the agenda for decolonization, we need to identify and be specific as to who is supposed to be in the driver's seat. Nehemiah? Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Nehemiah Latola. I'm from the science faculty. I'm a PhD student there. I come from a different school. I come from the school of chemistry, um, biochemistry, and, and all of the others. Um, I had the pleasure of being the chair, one of the chairs of the, the interactions yesterday, the pre science week launch interactions on diversity and inclusion, which largely spoke to the decolonization of the teaching and learning in science. Mm -hmm. um, one of my major concerns from that interaction was um, notions that came up that science was an unresponsive, um, 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 uh, unresponsive faculty. Um, people had things to say as that um, they did not know how we decolonize science. And that is worrying to me because um, a student was bringing up uh, notions that science is this Western form of education, whereas my belief of science is that it's a global endeavor. It's not specific to any region or place in the world. And therefore, then, when you come into a conversation and you say that science is a Western form of education, you, you, are, breaking, um, you are breaking a connection with me. Um, I want to also touch on the fact of the system at the NMMU, and specifically in science, we realize that the majority of our employees there, or the staff there, come from the old regime, which we know was largely built upon a capitalist, racist, um, um, not to, this is not to say that those um, employees still harbor those notions, but I just want to highlight that the system that we're coming from. How then does an employee in that system address this new set of rules that comes in that possibly threatens their income in a capitalist system or their ideas that they value? And another important thing that was raised was what is the factor of accountability here? There seems to be a disconnect from if we look at the institution as a as as this um, this being that sees the the student as a consumer and they are making these legislations as they are creating dynamic thinkers um, that come up with innovative thinking that doesn't reflect on faculty level. What is the accountability um, that speaks towards that within such a system? Um, I think I touched the importance of that. Thank you very much. Nadima? Yep. Thank you, Professor Nevis, Nadima. Um, I'm issues I want to just highlight. Um, the first is you, you, you made a very clear connection between capitalism, modernity, and colonialism and decoloniality. And, and for me, I think what would be missing, especially in, our, in this country, is, is, a, is, is an understanding of how political liberalism feeds into those systems as well. It's, 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 a, it's something that perhaps we, we know, but, but the notion of political ideology mm -hmm. around rainbowism and, you know, we are all one and this um, is <laughs> that feeds into systems of, of oppression that continue to decolonial practice. So, so our political positioning, um, the political ideologies that shape what we do as citizens of this country um, is, is part and parcel of that, that little triangle. That's the first one. The second one um, has been touched on by quite a few people here. First, of, uh, of course, by the student, which I, I really, really want to um, uh, side with it. And that's the idea, I have been asking myself the question, can the university um, do this by itself? Uh, it seems to me as though um, this, like, this individualism also pertains to the university when thinking about this transformation. And I, um, in terms of pedagogy, if we are going to talk about connections to socio-economic and political contexts, should not our pedagogy reflect the idea that we are we are part and parcel of a broader community, communities, mm. and that we need to be able to recognize that, define that, and able to to build in through into our pedagogies. 
that kind of thinking, because this elitism, which is an ideology in itself, um, somebody mentioned that it is an elite bourgeois. It is, um, but that, that does ne not necessarily mean we must be elite, we must harbor this ideology of elitism. We can be elite without being elitist. So I think those, that distinction needs to be made. And the last one is that this um, move towards plurality um, really gives me hope, but it also makes me really concerned that we're going to once again find our way into, not once again, we're going to find our way into a neo-apartheid system where we further essentialize, and we see this, we've seen it in the student movement, we, we see it in everyday social media comments, we see it everywhere, that, that we have not begun the conversation on difference and what that means. We are still defining under apartheid categories, we are still essentializing, even the counter-hegemonic stance is essentialized. So a conversation, a real, honest, and ongoing conversation around race, racism, plurality, multiculturalism, a critical conversation that brings into ideas, notions of power, so that we can start to break down what we yes. know. Thank you, Nadeem Rose. Thank you very much, Loki. Um, so my name is um, Rose also, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, and apologies to this take for not being here yesterday, but indeed circumstances were definitely beyond my control given my gendered existence. Um, I have two, two points I wish to make. One is around um, post-humanism, um, which you raised very briefly in your presentation. Um, and the, 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 the point of post-humanism is recentering or reprioritizing that which is not human. Mm. And how does that then sit in broader discussions of decolonialism and decoloniality if, if most of the discussions are about human beings being human? So that's, that's the first part of my question. The second one, which I thought was quite important, but perhaps did not really appear in the discussion, is around the notion of creolization or hybridity, um, which I perceive creolization as a continuously transcendental process of remaking in the face of epistemic violence and cognitive injustice. And it is, it is a space, uh, uh, Baba speaks about the third space, um, and it is a space where there is fundamental potential for positive response to cognitive injustice and epistemicide. And I, I want to know where creolization sits in that because it also opens a door for institutions that are then not necessarily locked into these binaries that you mentioned in your presentation, but that they have alternative spaces where they can, uh, they can be generative uh, uh, you know, power and generative, uh, you know, um, outputs that can bring, you know, the institution to a more um, <coughs> meaningful and, um, yeah, considerate space. Thank you, Rose. Um, over to you, Paul. <coughs> wow. Uh, very good points, very good questions. I'll see if I can uh, do justice to your comments. Um, let me start by the last one because I see I see the bit relevant to the uh, to the previous one in terms of plurality and and, and pluralism. And I think uh, I think you're both right. It has to be problematized. The notion of plurality, yes, it has a lot of potential uh, if it recognizes you know diversity and so on. But often it's hijacked by liberal and neoliberal discourses and. Um, and um, it, it has to be uh, put into conversation and, and criticism and not taken for granted uh, because it might give, you know, this false um, uh, image of, if I may, uh, with all your respect, of the rainbow nation at a very superficial level. Simply a recognition of plural, pluralism, but at the end of the day, the structures are there. Uh, and so we have to, yes. So di different theorists are talking about different responses, that pluralism is simply the beginning. We may need to talk about more specific to make it a connection with posthumanism. You have to talk about relationality, the relationality of different species, humans and non-human agents. So it's not uh, I mean, by centering the human, you're ignoring 
the contribution of, of non-human agents. And, non, and in this entanglement of the human and the non-human, you find it in many Southern African epistemologies that are marginalized by the more uh, austere, traditional Western, if you will, again, with, with a lot of care in the generalizations. So posthumanism does offer a potential to move the conversation and actually make a contribution because you acknowledge this entanglement and the hybridity that, that you talked about. Uh, but to, to come back to your point, yes, the dangers have to be acknowledged and tackled. Uh, and put into conversation, you know, the, uh, as much as I understand it's very difficult to do it, uh, it has to be done. Otherwise, the project will not, will not move forward. And the political, uh, certainly the, uh, the, the political ideologies are part of the conversation. And so the question, can the university do it by itself? Um, the, the, the simple answer is no. It cannot do it by itself. It's not isolated from the society. Uh, however, uh, to go back to my Foucaultian roots, you have to look at change pragmatically and micro-politically as well. What can you do in the micro-political spaces that you inhabit? And the micro-political space of the university has to take its responsibilities. So we cannot give up and say, well, if nothing else is going on, like outside, I understand with a lot of care, again, we make these dichotomies, but um, for the sake of the conversation. We cannot say if nothing is going on outside in the society, in the government, the corruption, the failing system, then there is nothing we can do. The question is, what can we do with the resources that we have in the political conditions that we uh, function? Um, to, now, your, your questions are, I mean, are really good questions. The unresponsive faculty, um, how to decolonize disciplines and how employees could address these questions. I think these are very good questions that you have to ask, you know, uh, at the uni. You have to discuss them within the university. I, I don't think that anybody, especially an outsider like me, can come and tell you, you know, uh, this is the way you do it. But I hear excellent questions and, and ideas here. The point is to find a way to have a sustained conversation that is, and I, as far as I know from my discussions in the past few days with uh, professors Alan and Denise Zin, there are things going on at this university, more so than in other universities that I know in South Africa. The challenge, and I know it's a challenge, you have to keep the conversation going and you have to have this, what I, what I called in my presentation, a strategic stepped approach. You have to pick your battles and you have to have a strategy. You cannot, you know, uh, think or imagine that you will change everything from one moment, moment to another. You have to be pragmatic without obviously selling your vision and your social justice uh, political vision. Uh, now, the, uh, uh, thank you for pointing out um, I, if I, if I did so and used most of the times colonialism later in, in, uh, compared to coloniality, uh, that's a good observation. It shouldn't happen. I, I think theoretically uh, coloniality is a more correct way of, uh, of entering the conversation. But I know that many people we are using out of, uh, out of rush to say things we, we go back to the habits of mind and colonialism. So you're very correct to point out uh, this slip of tongue. It has to, uh, if, if, if I'm correct to the conversation that I, that I offer, we have to use, I think, coloniality rather than colonialism. Although, I mean, 
there are different ideas about this. Um, and the first question, I think it's a very important question, your comment on what is the purpose of education? Like um, one of the most uh, um, uh, provocative conversations that started in the 19th century uh, by Herbert Spencer in 1867 that you find in every curriculum book uh, in the first, the very first meeting is what is the purpose of education? And I think it, it's not a rhetorical question. It's not a question that we have answered or we thought to have answered. It's a question that we have to answer, to ask every time that we have, you know, uh, a, a, a vision or, or we think we want something different from what we, we have at the moment. So it's, a very, it's an excellent question to keep in mind and go back to it from time to time to challenge our thinking and mostly our practices, not our thinking, our practices. How this notion of the purpose of education is actually manifested in practice because theoretically, we might say very nice things about the vision of the university, the vision of this curriculum, the vision of this government, and so on. The point is, what are the consequences and the implications and the practices that are being implemented every day in answering indirectly, and many times directly, this question? So that's a very, very good point, and thank you for pointing that out. Colleagues, thank you. Thank you for that wonderful round of, of questions. We have a question from George Campus, um, and the question reads as follows. My question is around Africanization. Is it practically possible to lecture any university course or program in indigenous language? We have the Bible that is written in all languages, if not the majority of languages in South Africa. So that's a question from our George campus. I'm only going to take two more questions from the floor. Yes, so you raise your hand and ma'am there. Only those two questions, because we need to conclude. All right, yes. Um. Thank you for having the opportunity. Um, I'm an undergrad student here as well. Um, Prof, when you began your talk, as um, the person behind me rightly noted, um, you mentioned um, colonialism and coloniality. Um, but uh, I would have loved if you had expanded on, on, on colonialism, so, because I understand that there's also a phenomenon called settler colonialism, and I think that yes. is our context in South Africa. Um, but um, moving on from that, um, I think I differ from, 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 from what you made out of decolonization and transformation and how you, you break up, up, up the two. I think you, you make the mistake of, of, of limiting the de decolonization to only um, institutes of higher learning or to higher education um, and, and, and not viewing it as a process of, of total liberation located mm -hmm. not only within the institution but um, also outside of, of, of the gates of the Ivory Tower, um, particularly here in South Africa, because of course we are um, a secular colonial state. So for me, to suggest that um, transformation, um, which is limited to higher education and learning, misses the fundamental point of humanizing both the dehumanized as well as the humanizer. I think um, transformation for me focuses mostly on the dehumanized and leaves the, the, the dehumanizer um, out of the picture. Um, yeah, um, I think that also in, in the student movement, I'm also part of the student movement. In the student movement, I think we had a, a different conceptualization of what we mean when we say we want decolonization. Um, and I think uh, it does not only recognize um, colonialism or racism and capitalism as modernities only systematic violences, but it also includes a cis-hetero patriarchy um, mm -hmm. and other different forms of mm -hmm. abilities. Um, yeah, I'll try to speak at that, but I would love for you to, to speak on how colonization would impact in a context where it's a settler colonial state, um, driven by, of course, white monopoly capital. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, a lot of people ask when we start with decolonization, and I think it helps to look at what colonization did. Firstly, it took the land away. So, I mean, that's our topic we're covering today. Mm -hmm. But an example of decolonizing the higher education system would be implementing 
research into how can we equitably redistribute the land. So that's just a practical example. Yeah. Um, number two, decolonization decolon uh, to Korea people's languages. So number one in decolonizing is giving back the languages. I mean, I don't understand how at a university we can't have indigenous language lectures. We've got so many lecturers who can speak the indigenous languages. I think if it just took the slightest amount of effort, we could do it very quickly. Um, number two, or number three, sorry, uh, colonization took away the power. So it took away the power from the education system itself. Uh, from the people through the education system, sorry. Um, so, within this institution, there is a power struggle. We've got people who are afraid to give up their power, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's haltering progress. Mm -hmm. I don't think it needs to take years and years and years. We can do practical things today. Um, I just wanted to say, for example, in terms of research, I think from just researching decolonization, there are so many white people who are speaking about the colonized. And there's not enough <coughs> colonized speaking about their own experiences. And we cannot give more importance or relevance to a researcher's name that we just so happen to know a bit better because we learned of that Western researcher at school. So that's just one example. And I think in a decolonial project, uh, Non-indigenous non researchers like myself will have to play a peripheral role. We can't get involved in the nitty gritties. And if I can just say this quote, I'm sorry I'm taking up everyone's mouth. No pedagogy which is truly liberating can remain distant from the oppressed by treating them as unfortunates and by, by presenting for their emu emulation models from among the oppressors. The oppressed must be their own example in the struggle for their redemption. And so, when I come back to the power, the power struggle within this university, the only way we're going to see change if, is, is if the, the institution gives some of its power to someone else. We don't know who. <laughs> but there needs to be a committee who has power to make change. And I feel like we're talking about talking about talking all the time. Yes. There's so many yes. other conferences. We can do it. We've got We've got ideas. We've got intellectuals who want to implement these ideas. We just don't have the power to actually make the change. And that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your for your thoughts and your comments. I think this is a this is a. a, a a very provocative uh, conversation and I'm glad we are having it and I hope that it will continue. Uh, uh, I, I will pick a few issues because it's impossible to, to, to comment on all of them. The, um, and um, there, there were some similarities in terms of some connections in some of the questions on, on multilingualism in courses. And I think there is a conversation, as far as I know, in some universities in South Africa considering, uh, considering this. And, and you know, it's, it's not uh, something uh, unique to South Africa. There have been other contexts around the world with multiple indigenous uh, languages and other languages and there are models of uh, implementing uh, uh, bilingual or other uh, uh, models in, in teaching approaches. So it's not something uh, something new in terms of doing it practically or technically. The issue is political, it's clearly political. If the institution is willing to give that space and acknowledge you know, uh, the different languages and give the space to those languages. Uh, so I, I think this is definitely an issue for, the, for, for your institution to discuss like in other institutions in, in, in South Africa. Um, now, uh, your question uh, here in front on, on colonialism, uh, thank you for the observation. It's a very good point that there are different forms of colonialism, and one of them is settler colonialism. And to uh, link to uh, the issue of the land and the redistribution, if we're talking about 
you know, if we're talking the theoretical model of Nancy Fraser, for example, of, you know, representation, recognition and redistribution, there has to be a serious conversation uh, about the redistribution, um, knowing that it's a sensitive and difficult issue, but I think we have to find, you have to find ways to, to talk about it without taking, you know, uh, moralistic positions, because it's easy to uh, end up with moralistic position, this is good, this is bad, this is black, this is white, uh, there is only two ways. So I think that there, there needs to be a lot of respect um, in, in the process of conversation, not respect of, you know, uh, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the different positions, I mean, that you have to necessarily uh, adapt to one or the other or more, but there has to be um, a, a, a genuine, honest conversation acknowledging the difficulties. And I know that there are sensitivities and there are, you know, opposing views, but I think we, we need to find ways to discuss those without uh, marginalizing people and without labeling them as so and so if they have a position that we disagree with. Um, yeah, I think I think I, I covered most of the points. I'm I'm sorry for the but there the, the have been very good points. So uh, I take them as as a point of departure for for further conversations in the future. Thank you very much for. Uh, what a tour de force! What a presentation! Almost two hours, and uh, Michaelinus has captivated our attention, uh, riveted us. And there's so much. I think we could have continued further and further. I've personally tremendously enjoyed this. Uh, we, 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 I recall that you started by saying that you hope you won't get into trouble. I'm not too sure why you said that. This is a safe place and this is what we should be doing at the university. So you won't get into trouble. Uh, and we would welcome further and further uh, discussions and uh, debates like this. Uh, Michaelinus is linked formally to our university as a research associate, and so you are always welcome. As our speaker as well, Professor Tate from yesterday afternoon's uh, plenary. You also uh, g gave us a, a short history into uh, you know, what is not a new debate uh, on decolonization. You uh, elaborated uh, the difference between decolon or colonialism and coloniality. Um, and then really the action that being human is a verb and decolonization is going to be a process. And we need to remember that. And then you finished with these five fundamental shifts and there was discussion. I appreciated that, that uh, uh, additional comment, but uh, we've taken note of those, those fundamentals that need to be part of the ongoing discussion. And I've just asked Alan, I know that this is being videoed, it will be uh, available from our CANRAD website and uh, possibly as a PDF, the actual slides as well, because there's a lot of information there. Colleagues, let me say something about the questions. These were rich um, interrogating questions, really uh, I appreciated it. Uh, to the lady in the front who's just had the paper, uh, well done to you. I'd love to hear more about it. That's brilliant to hear. Uh, but <laughs> so with... To you and everyone, you know, this is a fundamental principle. Don't put a potential funder on the spot publicly. Uh, but really, those questions were tremendous. Uh, where's our, our doctoral candidate? Yes, in chemistry. Finishing, hopefully, the end of the year or so. Uh, no. <laughs> you doing? First year of doctoral. Okay. Um, yeah, 
Absolutely. You, you had a very relevant question. And the one thought that I have had for some time, in fact, one of the committees that I chair is the Postgraduate Studies Committee for the university. And we have student movements, we have societies, but by and large they are driven by undergraduate students, the majority of our students. What about the postgraduate students? And so a forum of postgraduate students would be one possible way in which we could, we could uh, commence this discussion within faculties. Uh, and so I'd be happy to chat to you further and we could, we could explore that. And then just coming back to the computer science, and Professor Janet Wesson is, is my colleague from many years. You know, it, it, it's a, it, I appreciated your response. I appreciated the, the question. Uh, this week is, is Entrepreneurship Week. You may have seen. And so if we see computer skills as a tool that we can use, that we can empower ourselves so that we don't go out and we are, are looking for employment, but that we are employers. We, in terms of entrepreneurship, one of the things that we managed through, through my portfolio is, is uh, Propeller, which is our incubator. It's outside the university, but involved. We are involved in it. That's for student companies, one or two person companies that have grown and been established out of innovation and, and entrepreneurship ideas. So there are those areas that uh, we can take that particular skill and we can uh, make a career and a success, and in fact, impact society. At this point, I'm wanting to just say to all of you, thanks for being here. Uh, we, I'm aware that, in fact, at this very time, there are two other public lectures taking place. We, we are in an amazing space at the moment, uh, and I was hoping that we would have some here. We've got a full uh, venue. Every seat is adds up to 92. We must have had about 110 people here. So thanks to, for you uh, being here, and thanks again to our speaker. Thank you.